Now, the trial of Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis officer charged with killing George Floyd, is set to begin on Monday. Our next guest delve into the challenges with policing as America grapples with institutional reform. Philip Atiba Goff is one of the country's leading scholars on law enforcement and race. And Tracy Kesey is a former captain with the Denver Police Department. They co-founded the Center for Policing Equity. And here they are talking with our Michelle Martin about strengthening relations with the communities they serve. Thanks, Christian. Tracy Kesey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Philip Atiba Goff, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Dr. Kesey, I want to point out that you're a 25-year police veteran. In addition to your academic work, you retired as a captain of the Denver Police Department. And I do need to note that a police officer was killed as he went to respond to uh, what became a, a, a mass casualty event at a supermarket in Boulder. What does this moment bring up for you? It brings up a lot of things. First, it brings up the emotions and the feelings of when you lose an officer in the line of duty the devastation that it brings not only to the community in which he served, but to his family and his seven children that are left behind. To look at what's happening in these last couple of you know, days tells you just how complex the situations are that we are really truly dealing with when we talk about policing, when we talk about public safety and law enforcement. It is exactly what we talk about when we have yet an officer who ran towards danger as he was trained to take his, you know, lose his life and then on the other conversation to have a conversation around how officers are treating black communities and other communities of color. There's so many threads in American life are colliding at this point that speak to your work. I mean, the, the officer who has been charged in connection with the death of George Floyd, that trial is about to begin. Uh, the anniversary of the death of Breonna Taylor, um, her family has just reached a, a significant settlement with the city of Louisville, another set of trials that's going forward or charges that are going forward are connected to the mob attack on the U.S. Capitol back in January. And one of the disturbing things that has emerged is that a disproportionate number of those currently charged either have ties to the military or ties to law enforcement. What's that about? It's not new. I can tell you that's what that's about. Um, the issue of white supremacy in the military and in policing is not a new issue. What is, what's new is the fact that the light really now has been shown on it and people have to respond. So the question that a lot of us have, not just you know retired officers, but current officers, I'm sure the military the same way, is what do you do? How do you begin to address those issues and those folks that are inside these organizations? And then how do you screen so you don't continue to bring them in? And so again, it's not new, but it also it really does add to what the communities across this country have been saying in the way in which they've been treated in the way in which they are being approached about their own public safety. I can tell you a lot of my law enforcement colleagues who were very much about previous administration and being pro-law enforcement, we're at a loss for words when you have a group of people that you continue to claim support law enforcement and yet you take the life of law enforcement. So I think that we really have to have that conversation about what did we really see um, on that morning? And what we saw was white supremacy on display and folks really not wanting to deal with the outcomes of that. Is, is, it, is it your sense that some people are attracted to this work because they see it as upholding the authority of a certain group of people over other people? I think some people, I would hope that some people now know the history of, say, the, the Ku Klux Klan infiltration of police agencies, for example, or sort of the overlap between people who actually belong to white terrorist groups in their off time and then, you know, belong to these law enforcement agencies and the, but I think a lot of people think that that's of the past. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure some people think, well, that's not, that's back then, but that's not now. No, I, and I would say that there, there may be some who feel that way, but if you really want to ask what's going on inside the organization and the feel of what is happening when we talk about white supremacy, ask officers of color. Um, we on a daily basis have conversations with black officers from across this country who will tell you they are not only experiencing it, they are navigating it, they are managing it, they're trying to get to retirement because of it. And so when you ask who's really thinking about, you know, who's attracted to this particular profession, you have a lot of thousands of officers who want to serve, who really want to do the right thing. And you have some that are attracted to it for the, all of the wrong reasons. And part of the conversation that we're having and we continue to have is the tools that are used to screen people in 
and screen people out. And what we find, you know, even as we look across this country, you can look at processes for people trying to join a police department and you can tell who is going to be screened out before they even get a chance to go into that academy. It's typically black men and it's typically women of color. And so one of the interesting conversations that's really happening around this, right, and I think this is from um, the new administration is to invest millions of dollars into recruiting so police organizations can reflect their community. What is sort of tone deaf about that is not asking about the experiences of black officers and women in policing to know whether or not that is the way that you wanna go. You can certainly invest millions of dollars are spent in recruiting across this country, but once folks get in, it's completely different than what they were told it was going to be. And unless you deal with the culture of policing, you're not gonna retain new people. I'd love to hear more about the culture of police. Maybe uh, Dr. Goff, you wanna pick it up here. I'm sure some people are listening to our conversation and they're feeling, well, gosh, I mean, that's a hard job as evidenced by the fact that a man was just killed for doing it, right? So I think some people would say, well, why would you, uh, why would you do that job if you were a bad person, if you wanted to hurt people? The people who do that job are people who want to help people. How can bad things happen if good people who want to help people are doing that job? You do have people who want to do the right thing for a living show up at the door and say, I'm ready to serve. That's a powerful statement. I'm ready to serve. And they mean that. And they're trained to put themselves between danger and the rest of their community. Don't, I, we can't let go of that and forget that as if that doesn't happen. It just happened then. And I, I want to bring his, his name, Officer Goodman, who was a hero on January 6th, where everybody said, look at this black man saving all of, of Congress. That is a sworn officer, right? It's a sworn officer who was called a traitor by the people on the steps of the Capitol. It's not just about who shows up and does law enforcement. It's also what we allow, what we require law enforcement to do as the residents of communities. Right? Law enforcement didn't just show up in Central Park. They were called. Law enforcement didn't decide that they wanted to be the first responders to substance abuse and mental health and homelessness. We decided we were going to take all the money out of the social services that serve those communities, and we were going to send law enforcement instead. Think about that just for a second. As a country, community by community, city by city, state by state, we decided instead of having services for folks who are having the worst time of their lives, we were only gonna have that, that support them, services that help them to get better. We were only gonna have services whose job was, whose mission was to determine the need for punishment. So on two levels, we gotta get the right people into the job, but we gotta decide what the job should be. Because if the job is only gonna be wherever there are black and brown people struggling, I want to send badges and guns. I want to send people whose job is to determine, should we take away liberty? Should we take away life? If that's our decision, don't blame law enforcement officers or law enforcement executives for the fact that that's what happens when they show up. Blame us, because we kept deciding that that was the mission of law enforcement. So that double duty, getting the right people in, but deciding the right mission for those people, that's what communities across the country are figuring out. If we want to shrink the size, the footprint, of the way that we punish, what could public safety look like? And the reason you're hearing people say, reimagine, is because often we're stuck in the trap that either you gotta have cops or you have lawlessness, as if there's no other way to put a society together. Now talk about that, because it, you've mentioned that a number of jurisdictions as a way to reimagine the way policing is done, the way justice is done, have elected, say, reformist prosecutors. And that, that's important because, you know, prosecutors determine, you know, what cases will be brought and how those cases will be disposed of. Presumably, they're going to change the incentives for the behavior on the, uh, that's happening on the street. But what we've seen in a number of these jurisdictions is a furious reaction to these reformist moves, even though these are people who are elected, you know, by the people. But what do you make of that? Like, what does that say? I think it's, it's really clear that there's some forms of power that are being threatened in a way that they don't like, right? And I want to be also clear, this too is not new. Whenever folks came by and said, the power that shapes the United States into a white supremacist society is going to be challenged, white supremacy said, hey, might have forgot about us, we're still here. That's where violence happens, mass violence, where threats happen, where the FBI is mobilized against the, this notion of just Black liberation. If you think about a, a sort of simpler version of it, not just progressive prosecutors, but the, the battle cry that sort of 
cohered this moment in the, the long struggle for Black uh, uh, emancipation and liberty. Black lives matter? How anodyne a statement is that? Black lives are nifty. Black lives are not to be degraded, to be dis, you know, discarded um, without, th that has led to folks calling for further prosecution, to new federal penalties for black identity extremists. When power is threatened, this is what you see. And the power in the United States is not just corporate power, though it's also that. It's not just elected power, though it's also that. It's also the power of white racial politics. And it is being threatened right now more directly than we've seen over the past several decades. Dr. Keyes, what are your thoughts about this? Do you see an appetite for, in these departments for, what, what do you see as a person who's, who's done that job, who's been on the street, who's been in the patrol cars, who's been on you know, patrol and who works with people you know, throughout your career and now, of course, has a look at it from a research perspective? What do you see? As we look at the work that's going on across the country, what you see are communities exercising their power where historically it has been sort of counted on that they weren't paying attention or they were just good with it. What is interesting about that power and what we see in, in the conversations that we're having with our chiefs, we have a lot of chiefs that really want to make sure that they are providing the right type of service for the community. I'm gonna say that just flat out. They want to see it. Where you find a lot of the struggle happening is understanding how that should happen and what does it look like. There is a tremendous amount of concern in regards to, as you know, we've all been talking about, what do we do and how do we sort of help get through this sort of spikes in violent crime? How do we make sure that victims need services, get those services? And so we're really trying to manage that piece. That's in addition to how do those services really, in an equitable sense, get even sort of parsed out? So if you have folks that have mental health issues and you'll hear this in law enforcement, there isn't a chief that will tell you we should be the number one folks answering those calls for people in mental health crises. They just won't. But what they will tell you is there are some of those calls as well where you have folks who have not been on their meds that may be violent. How do we help protect those workers who are going in, um, who we believe are the right people to be going in? So you hear those really healthy conversations happening. I'm thinking about that the case and another case from Colorado, Elijah McLean in Aurora, in Aurora, Colorado. And he's walking along the street, going home. He's tackled by police officers for no reason that anybody can determine, really. He's injected with a powerful sedative, and he dies. And how do we think about something like this? I mean, what, what needs to change so that something like this does not happen again? There was a, a lot of work done after Elijah McLean's death. They did a incredible, I don't know if you've seen it, they did an incredible review of the entire process to even say that the, the stop was not legal, but what he needed was a mental health service. Even, you know, as you go on these calls, like most of us have, and you walk into these spaces and you yourself are saying, I'm not what these people need. I'm not what they need, but all I have is this. So if there's something in there that may be able to provide some level of comfort or provide some level of service, then if I can, I will. The number one thing we're hearing really around some of the pushback on the reimagining work is, well, if you get rid of, you know, first the narrative is, well, you're going to get rid of all the armed officers. That's not it. It is really reduce that footprint to have the officers doing exactly what they say they want to do, and that's crime. When we do the analysis on 911 calls, you know that at least 2 to 4% of those calls are violent crime, the rest are social service calls. That tells you that we're out of alignment here about what we should be doing and providing with community. Another sort of issue that has emerged in recent weeks, even though it's clearly been going on for quite some time, is the rise in assaults on people of Asian descent. And I'd like to ask you, how do you think we should think about this? Because you're already seeing in the conservative media a desire to move the focus to Black on Asian crime that is happening, that is a thing that is happening. We're seeing a focus, a renewed focus on, again, this notion that defunding the police is the cause of this spike in assaults. Okay, how do you think we should think about this? How should we be talking about this? Yeah, so I think part of the reason why it's confusing in the space that we're at right now is because we've been so dishonest about our history. 
right? Um, when you have folks at the bottom of the social hierarchy fighting with each other, it's really easy to take the, the camera lens, focus in on them and say, why do they hate each other so much? And not zoom out and say, it's in part because they've been given so few resources. There are other people who are benefiting from this, right? So part of the way that we should be thinking about this is that you've got immigrant communities with, you know, born in the United States or native to the United States um, communities that are put in terrible positions of vulnerability, economic vulnerability, and a lack of, of social power. So that creates tensions because ain't nobody got enough in those communities. Those tensions become racialized in the service of folks who are extracting all of the resources out of those communities in the first place. If we had a broader lens, a broader understanding of who's actually benefiting and who's actually suffering, we would blame the folks who have very little far less than we do. But the other piece of this is that we tend to frame conflict in the United States around race as if only black people and white people exist, as if it's not that contest, that, the, the, that, that sin of slavery, we call it the original sin, but how do you have stolen people doing all this labor unless you also have land that's been stolen? Right? So the genocide towards Native and brothers and sisters on, on this country, we have to acknowledge that. And the imported um, <clears throat> indentured servitude that Chinese laborers got to do when they were forced to build railroads, also an incredible, backbreaking, disgusting, racialized form of violence that helped build the capital and the resources of the country. So when we frame racism as if it's a white thing happening to black people, and we don't frame it as part of this larger project of extraction of resources from black folks and brown folks and red folks, right? From Asian folks and native folks, everybody, right? If we don't frame it that way, then it's easy to think that the problem is between whoever we catch on camera in that moment. I wanted to ask what you think the Biden administration should be doing right now. So one of the things that we want to make sure is happening, um, especially with this new administration, is there is an understanding that policing is really local. We have violence interrupters throughout this country who have stepped in in communities and have done things that police could not do. You have to invest in that work that's happening. And there seems to be, for some reason, a, a reason not to want to do that to want to put it in some kind of structure that feels acceptable other than what may work and doesn't look like the way we think it should. There are a lot of things I believe in in the George Floyd Act that will be helpful um, for us. We always talk about data collection. Um, in some of that work, there's conversations about collecting data for us. You collect everything. Do not sort of restrict, be very clear. And we have you know, a lot of things on our website that helps guide those things where you can figure out what should everybody be collecting. So we truly can begin to look at what we need to do and to supplement the work that's happening on the ground. The thing that I want folks to be able to do, as you've been hearing bits and pieces of, I want us to gain a kind of historical literacy with consequences. There are things that we have done in this country to accumulate wealth and power in incredibly concentrated ways. And it's always been on the backs of immigrants and darker skinned folks, right? That is not known, not as widely as it needs to be. It's not acknowledged and we don't act on it. So if we don't have a full accounting of the ways in which this country has benefited from our terrible treatment of vulnerable folks, there's no way to build the structures that prevent that exploitation going forward including policing. Tracy Kesey, Philippa Tibagoff, thank you both so much for speaking with us today and sharing your expertise. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, Michelle.